If you start having lucid nightmares where you're attacked by a disfigured serial killer and any damage taken in the dream manifests in reality, what do you do? I'm gonna break down the mistakes made by the Springwood teenagers, what you should do, and how to beat Freddy Krueger in a nightmare on Elm Street. Nearly a decade after the infamous Springwood slasher, Freddy Krueger murdered 20 children and was burned to death by the victim's parents, a girl named Tina dreams herself walking through a musty boiler room with deranged laughter echoing down the corridor. Little does she know this nightmare game of hide and go seek is very real and very deadly. Tina continues aimlessly walking around the industrial facility until the man stalking her jumps out and taunts her by shredding some hanging fabric with his claw hands. She gets cornered by him and screams in what she thinks is her last moment alive before being butchered, only to hear babies and goats passing by. Thinking the suspicious lull in the chase means she's safe, she lets out a deep sigh of relief which is when Freddy Krueger grabs her from behind, scaring her awake. Tina's mom rushes into her room to see if she's okay. Tina replies that it was just a bad dream, until she looks down and sees that her nightgown was shredded, as if by the man in her nightmare's finger blades. At this point, Tina knows this was more than a mere bad dream. Somehow the cut she experienced in her nightmare manifested in real life. The slashes in her nightgown couldn't have been made by her own fingernails. They're way too precise and symmetrical. The only logical explanation is that she sleepwalked into her bathroom and cut it with scissors. It's far-fetched, but not as far-fetched as believing the man in your dream slashed you up in real life. So far, it all just seems like a really bad dream that she acted out subconsciously, something to monitor and maybe talk to someone about. On the way to school the next morning, Tina tells her friends Nancy, Glenn, and Rod about her nightmare. Nancy consoles her, saying that she had a nightmare last night too, and that the only thing you can do to stop it is tell yourself you're having a bad dream, that the realization that you're having a bad dream should be enough to wake you up from it. With her parents out of town and being understandably frightened about last night's sleep slashing, Tina has Nancy and Glenn sleep over so she isn't alone. Tina tells Nancy that all day long she's been seeing the man in her nightmare's disfigured face and hearing his nails scrape against the walls. If Tina wasn't freaked out enough already, Nancy tells her that last night she had a similar nightmare with the same badly burned man wearing a red and green striped sweater who had knives for fingernails. Glenn adds that two people having the exact same dream is nearly impossible. The coincidences are racking up. Their disturbing epiphany is interrupted by a weird noise at the front of the house. Instead of ignoring it like normal human beings, they all go out outside to check it out with Glenn on point. Right when Glenn declares that there's nothing out there and turns his back on the unchecked dark tree line, Rod tackles him. The two lovely couples go back inside and lock up. Nancy is not in the mood after hearing how Tina had the exact same nightmare, so she takes Tina's bed while the frustrated Glenn takes the couch. Tina's still anxious about going to sleep after shacking up with Rod in her mom's bed. Rod sympathetically says that he had a bad dream last night too, and then turns over to go to sleep, leaving Tina wondering if his dream was the same as her and Nancy. So far, there's been more coincidence than consequence. Nancy and Tina are thoroughly creeped out by the realization that the same bladed burned man was stalking them in their dreams, which is why Nancy telling Glenn to hit the couch for trying to mack on her while she was disturbed makes no sense. Wouldn't you want someone sleeping next to you? Nancy hasn't been attacked like Tina though, so her disbelief is high enough to not be too concerned. Tina also found out that Rod had a nightmare last night too. He doesn't tell her what it was about, nor does she press him for more details, which is a mistake. What are the chances that the man you had a one night stand with also had a dream bad enough to tell you about it? The same night that your friend said that she had the exact same dream as you. There's a good chance it's about the disfigured man too. While Tina should have questioned Rod about his dream, figuring out he was having the same vivid nightmare wouldn't really help her that much. No real threat has been perceived and there's been zero evidence that this is anything more than an unlikely case of folly ado, a shared delusional disorder. I'm afraid Tina has to take the first hit for them to realize that this isn't just a bad dream. Beating an enemy like Freddy often requires a bit of luck to survive long enough to identify the problem without being destroyed, then being able to critically think and use proper logic to develop a solution. Sharpen your mind with this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform for STEM disciplines that teaches you how to think and solve problems with fun, interactive lessons. With Brilliant's hands-on approach, you'll learn science, computer science, and math in a new way with well-crafted stories, visual examples, and challenging problems to solve. There are courses designed for all skill levels that will take you from curiosity to mastery. We all think we understand logic and how to think, but do we really? Is this too meta? Brilliant's course on mathematical fundamentals will teach you how to reason forwards and backwards through situations to determine the result with interactive puzzles that give you feedback on how you're doing as you solve the puzzle. In the movie Circle, we see one iteration of a 
series of competitive games being played to determine human fitness. In a different spaceship, contestants might have colored hats on their heads, and each person has to determine what color their hat is. In this lesson, people are allowed to give statements without explicitly saying who has what color. It's up to you to use logic to determine what color hat each person has. Brilliant has STEM courses covering a range of disciplines designed by award-winning instructors. Find what piques your interest and learn at your own pace. The first 200 that sign up at brilliant.org slash nerdexplains will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. While Nancy's sleeping, the cross hanging on the wall falls off, momentarily waking her up. She clutches it and goes right back to sleep. In her dream, Freddy tries to crawl through the wall, only to retreat once she awakens. She puts the cross back up and taps on the wall, like checking a tooth that felt loose in your dream. Thinking it was just her imagination, she falls asleep again. Since it takes some time to get back to REM sleep, Freddy starts hunting his next victim. Tina wakes up to rocks hitting her window and a phantom voice calling her name. This time, she defiantly yells back before walking outside by herself in the dark night to confront whatever evil man is out there. The voice calls out to her again this time from the alleyway behind her house. Tina takes the bait and is confronted by the same man in a fedora, a dirty red and green striped sweater, and a glove with knives for fingers. He taunts her with his twisted laugh, whispering her name like a creepy uncle, walking towards her with his arms elongating to block the entire alleyway. Tina loses control over her fear and runs in the opposite direction. She does a risky over-the-shoulder look to see if the man is chasing her while sprinting in the debris-filled alley, only to run into him as soon as she looks back. She escapes his grasp and flees into her backyard where he leaps out at her from behind a tree. He taunts her again, this time by joyfully slicing his own fingers off. She tries to run back inside to perceived safety, but the man grabs her before she can. Rod gets woken up from Tina's possessed convulsions rocking the bed. He rips the covers off and sees her body being ragdolled by a ghost. When he tries to help, her body is thrown into him, knocking him down. He helplessly watches in horror as her chest is sliced open by a claw and she's dragged up to the ceiling to bleed out. Nancy and Glenn heard Tina screaming and burst into the room to find the horrifying scene of Tina's bloody carved up corpse on the bed with blood trails all over the ceiling. Rod's gone, taken off out the window in fear of whatever killed Tina and knowing he's going to be blamed for it. When Tina woke up, she didn't seem to have the awareness that she was lucid dreaming, even with a phantom voice whispering her name. Tina's decision to go outside and confront her stalker alone at night wasn't the smartest move, especially since she's having a hard time understanding if she's dreaming or not. For all she knows, there's a real creep outside waiting to mug her. Even if she was aware that she was dreaming, it's still a terrible decision. Why would she want to confront her dream stalker, who, as far as she thinks, caused her to subconsciously cut her own nightgown up in real life? Just go back to sleep. Her false confidence counterproductively caused her to get baited into a dark, isolated alleyway, which was far more likely to induce deeper fear. When Freddy ambushed her, she lost complete control over her mind. Her panicking and uncontrolled anxiety unwittingly empowered Freddy and escalated her nightmare to deadly levels. Given that she thought that she was having a bad dream, she didn't really make any egregious mistakes. She was just unfortunate enough to be Freddy's first victim. As for Rod, there was nothing he could do to save her. She was clearly murdered by a supernatural force. Fleeing the murder scene was a mistake, though. It immediately made him the top suspect and increased his chances of being convicted for her death. Staying and providing his report to the police, although entirely unbelievable, would certainly add to his innocence. What murderer would wait for the cops? Forensics should be able to tell that Rod's blade didn't cause her wounds, and prove that Rod wouldn't have been able to drag Tina's body across the ceiling. I could see how he'd fear being wrongfully imprisoned for her death. Rod had been having the same nightmare as Tina and Nancy, and had overheard them talking about nightmares on the way to class. It's a bit of a stretch, but he might be able to put together Tina's cause of death, the claw, and the weapon of choice for their shared dream demon. He needs to find Nancy and tell her what happened and how it might be connected with her dreams. Nancy doesn't know for sure that Rod didn't kill Tina. It's unbelievable to think that he would or could have caused the floor-to-ceiling carnage, but she didn't see anything that would lead her to believe otherwise. Everyone's too shocked and confused to be able to do anything, and the lack of hard evidence is causing them to doubt their own sanity. At the police station, Nancy's giving her account of what happened to Lieutenant Donald Thompson, who's also her father. He thinks that Rod, being a nefarious delinquent of sorts, murdered Tina. Nancy defends Rod, saying that they were sleeping over because Tina dreamed that this would happen, that someone was going to come kill her. Lieutenant Donald isn't convinced. All evidence is pointing to Rod. Innocent or guilty, Rod needs to be found. 
so Lieutenant Donald mounts a citywide manhunt. The next morning on Nancy's walk to school, Rod jumps out and pulls her into the bushes. He pleads that he's innocent. Before they can talk further, Lieutenant Thompson and his men surround them and arrest Rod. At school, her teachers professing a foreshadowing story of rotten evil and the nature of man. These teachers always have super relevant curriculum. It's impressive. Nancy's too tired from her sleepless night to give a shit and falls asleep, only to awaken in her own twisted dream version of class. She sees Tina in a bloody body bag calling her name. The previously nervous student reading in front of the class now looks possessed, reading scriptures from memory. When she looks back to where Tina was, there's a trail of blood leading down the hallway. Nancy steps out of the class and sees the body bag get dragged around the corner by an invisible force. She chases after it and runs into a hall monitor wearing the familiar red and green sweater who asks her for her hall pass. Nancy tells her to fuck off and continues following Tina's blood trail until she stopped cold in her tracks when the girl speaks in a creepy man's voice. When Nancy turns around, the hall monitor has blood on her face, waving a knife glove at her, telling her that there's no running in the hallway while cackling. Nancy ignores her and follows the blood trail into the school's basement boiler room while calling Tina's name. It's down in the depths, far and isolated from perceived safety, that Freddy reveals himself to her. He uses his knife hand to slice open his stomach, which is filled with bile and maggots. Nancy's fear causes her to lose control of her dream again, and every exit turns into a solid wall, like deja vu in the Matrix. Freddy closes in on her, taunting her, saying, come to Freddy. She yells back to herself that this isn't real, that it's just a bad dream, which does nothing to stop his advance. Just before he can slash her with a glove, Nancy kicks herself out of the dream by burning her arm on a scalding hot pipe. The perceived pain inflicted in the dream causes an adrenaline dump that wakes her up screaming. Embarrassed and frightened, she runs out of the class and breaks down. When she calms down, she realizes that her arm was burned in real life. With nowhere else to go and nobody else who would understand, she visits Rod in person to figure out what happened, and if there's a connection. Her fears are confirmed. Rod is having the same nightmare, haunted by the same figure with a knife glove. Nancy tells him that she knows he didn't kill Tina, and then leaves without another word. For being an innocent teenager who just saw her friends get massacred, Nancy did a pretty good job. Not without mistakes, though. When the nightmare kicked in, she got baited into more terrifying situations like Tina. This induced more fear, creating a vicious cycle which Freddy fed upon. By the time she realized she was dreaming, she was in too deep to really let go and actualize her disbelief. Like Tina, she tried to run, realizing that she was in a dream, she should have known that there's no creating spatial distance in the mind. Running only elevates your own belief that you're prey, worsening the situation. I can't really critique her dream performance too much. You don't always have full control over yourself in your dreams, even in lucid dreams. Often it feels pre-scripted, like you're watching a first-person movie. Veteran lucid dreamers extensively practice to be able to retain some control over their dreams. Nancy was lucky to survive long enough to learn some useful things. The psycho haunting her dreams, who calls himself Freddy, is actually able to injure and kill her. Somehow the wounds he inflicts manifest in the real world. She now knows without a doubt that Rod didn't kill Tina. Freddy did. And he's coming for her, her friends, and probably a lot of other people. She also crucially learned that it's possible to wake herself out of the nightmare by self-inflicting severe pain. This is a double-edged sword, though. Freddy isn't the only danger. She can inadvertently cause her own death by what she dreams and how she reacts in the dream. Now that she knows her nightmares are deadly, the first order of business is to do whatever she needs to stay awake. The longest someone's ever stayed awake for was around 11 days. That's the upper limit on how long she has to figure out how to defeat her foe. REM sleep, which is when you dream, only starts after around 90 minutes of sleep. Taking short naps can help your body repair without entering Freddy's world. Stimulants like caffeine are a no-brainer, but you're gonna need to do more than that to avoid falling asleep after a couple of days. You could take the crank high voltage approach of hooking a car battery up to your tongue, but that's a bit excessive. Cold showers, getting pissed off at inflammatory news, always having something to do, keeping a taser on deck, and having Glenn nearby to make sure she doesn't fall asleep are all good options too. Not dreaming ever again isn't really possible. Nancy wouldn't have known about the fictional drug Hypnosil seen later in the series. She could try to be put into a medically induced coma by acting crazy but eventually she's gonna have to come out of it. She could get a lobotomy too, but that's also hardly a solution either. Now that she knows how to stave off sleep, at least for a while, she can start trying to figure out what's going on and how to stop it. It's not clear how this began, why she's targeted, and who Freddy is. It's been a while since Freddy was killed 
and this is the 80s. There's no computers. Nancy wouldn't have known or suspected it was a real person, given that he only shows up in her dreams, and her ability to end the dreams means that she has at least some control. He's invading her dream, but it's still her dream. So far, her attempts at telling herself that it's not real, and that it's just a bad dream, have not worked out too well. It's not to say it doesn't work. If it's her dream, she should be able to render him inert by imagining she's picking daisies. Realizing that she's in a dream and kicking herself awake are the only things proven to work so far. You can't kick yourself awake if you don't know that you're in a dream, though. Realizing you're in a dream is hard to do. Dreams are disorienting and feel real when you're in them. Lucid dreamers typically use things called reality checks to become aware that they're dreaming, which are observations of omnipresent inconsistencies between the dream and real world. For example, when we dream, the area of the brain associated with interpreting language, namely the Wernick's area, is significantly less active. If you suddenly can't read and anything with text or numbers is blurry, you're probably dreaming. The problem is that this requires extensive practice to be able to do. Once aware that she's dreaming, Nancy can kick herself awake. This is still difficult. Freddy's nightmare worlds are immersive and vivid. Kicking herself out of the dream from within requires extremely jarring actions that are dangerous to her in real life body. Not sure the old pinching technique will do. We've seen people fall, trip, get cut apart, and still not wake up. This severity of the kick required, coupled with the manifestation of wounds in real life, means that kicking isn't sustainable. You'd have to severely damage yourself every night. That and you have to be able to repeatedly do it before Freddy has a chance to inflict a mortal wound. That's all Nancy can really hope to achieve right now. That didn't help her friends. If Tina was killed by the same nightmare that Nancy had, that means Glenn and Rod could be in danger too. She needs to warn them, let them know that they aren't crazy, how to kick themselves out of the nightmare, and that possibly the only only sustainable way out is disbelief. While it's tempting to tell everyone else what's going on and try to get help, nobody else is going to understand. Telling them someone in her dreams is trying to kill her is going to get her admitted into a psych ward where she has little chance of stopping Freddy. Nancy goes home and with her newfound information, takes a relaxing bubble bath that causes her to fall asleep. Before Freddy can finger blade her femoral arteries, her mother Marge knocks on the door, warning her to not fall asleep in the tub. Nancy yells back, yeah mom I know, and then falls right back to sleep. This time, Freddy tries to drown her by pulling her underwater into some kind of abyss below the tub. Marge hears Nancy's struggles and tries to open the door to help, but it's locked. Marge's screams at Nancy helped Nancy withdraw from the dream enough to pull herself back to the surface and into reality. Marge jimmies the door open with a clothes hanger, freaking out and wondering what the hell happened. Nancy pretends she simply fell and everything's fine now, then locks the door after her mother leaves. Her concerned parents are watching over her closely and won't let her leave now. Not that she has anywhere to go. Since she's stuck in her room and too afraid to sleep, she sneaks a pot of coffee in and tries to stay busy reading books and watching movies. I don't know if Nancy has given up or is trying to zen out to try to take her mind off Freddy, but she's done nothing but waste time and put herself in vulnerable situations. No warning or getting help from her friends. No attempts to find solutions and no attempts to stay awake until she does. Taking a hot, relaxing bath is the worst thing you can do if you're trying to stay awake, not to mention locking the bathroom door when it's imperative that people around you can help wake you up if you start convulsing from your nightmares of Freddy. Nancy was lucky that Marge was watching over her and was able to wake her up in time. This nightmare made it clear that she can't rely solely on reality checks and kicking herself awake. There's no way to check an alarm clock and burn her arm when she's immediately thrust underwater and drowning. It was so fast and severe that you can't step back and namaste unless you're Neo. If reality checks and dream kicking aren't going to suffice on their own, she needs a new approach. I'm not opposed to the Zen approach. Her underlying anxiety about Fred is probably what's causing the immediate severe nightmares that are nearly uncontrollable. That night, Glenn sneaks over to check on her. Nancy asks him if he's had bad dreams too. He says he hasn't. Since he hasn't been visited by Freddy, he still thinks that Rod killed Tina. Despite this, he agrees to watch her back while she goes to check on Rod at the precinct. Glenn follows her outside for a while, but Nancy eventually loses him, if he was ever there. Nancy likely would have changed her attire to something more tactical if this was reality. She's close enough to Rod's jail cell to push on without stopping to consider that she's dreaming. Nancy gets over to Rod's jail cell and sees Freddy moving in for the kill. She freaks out yelling for Glenn, who's still nowhere to be found. 
When she looks back at his cell, Rod's safe and Freddy disappeared. She then sees Tina in the body bag, with sludge worms on her feet and bugs crawling out of her mouth. Tina's not having a good time. Freddy jumps out of the bushes at her and chases her back to her home while laughing maniacally. Nancy tries to run upstairs to where she thinks her parents and Glenn are, but the stairs are made of extra chewy bubblegum. It still doesn't occur to her that she's dreaming. She makes it into her room and sees Glenn passed out. Now realizing that she's in a dream, she looks in the mirror and tries to tell herself none of it's real. There's still doubt in her voice, which gives Freddy enough power to dive through the mirror at her. Nancy's saved from strangulation when her alarm clock goes off, kicking her out of the dream screaming. Nancy must have unintentionally fallen asleep around when Glenn arrived. She's immediately pissed that Glenn failed to do his one job to stay awake and wake her up if she's having a nightmare. This dream seemed like a premonition, so Nancy convinces Glenn to sneak to the precinct with her to check on Rod for real this time. Without any training or advice or friends, he would be an easy target for Freddy. When they finally get the cops to check on Rod, they find him strangled to death, hung up by his own bedsheet. Lieutenant Donald and the others immediately pronounce him dead. Rod's death may have been preventable had Nancy warned him about Freddy's power and told him how he could survive the dreams. It's a far shot considering Nancy isn't doing so well either. Rod wasn't strangled for long enough to cause brain death, which takes four to five minutes. The cops got him down right after he lost consciousness. They should have immediately performed CPR. It still might not have saved him though. CPR isn't as effective as TB would lead you to believe. If they performed CPR correctly and quickly, Rod may have had a 20 to 30% chance of resuscitation. With Rod and Tina dead, Nancy and Glenn are next on the list. Nancy's gotten very lucky that in the past two nightmares, she was woken up by Mark and her alarm clock just before getting killed. For some reason, even though she's able to realize she's in a dream, she still makes the amateur mistake of running, trying to get help, and generally panicking at every one of Freddy's obvious taunts. The one thing she did right in the dream was to look at her reflection in the mirror. Looking at your reflection in the mirrors is another form of reality check. This is because your mind has trouble creating reflections, especially your own. When you look into the mirror, if the image in it is dark, blurry, misshapen, or empty, it helps to give you the awareness to realize you're dreaming. Nancy must have read up on some dream skills to know this or got lucky again. Again, it's extremely hard to even remember to perform reality checks and to be able to realize you're dreaming, especially when they mimic her normal surroundings. When Nancy looked into her mirror, her reflection was intact. This could be because her dream world is shared with Freddy. It's partly his dream too. This might also explain why her reality checks aren't effective. In this case, she could try to use an Inception totem. I know Inception came out way later and it's not reasonable for Nancy to think of it, but the concept is interesting. Inception totems are items you keep on your person that have been modified that the dream owner doesn't know about, which creates a discrepancy. If your loaded dice isn't loaded anymore because the dream owner doesn't know you loaded them and thus didn't materialize it, it's evidence that you're dreaming. Might work, might not. Worth a shot, I suppose. Nancy's been sleep deprived long enough that she needs to really be strategic about her methods for staying awake or she's going to be unknowingly nodding off all the time. If she can stay awake long enough, she might be able to find out that this is happening to other people or if strange deaths are occurring around the town and if there's a pattern to the killings, like they're all kids, all local geographically, etc. She should probably still be discreet about all this. Some days later, they held Rod's funeral. Nancy's having a tough week. Two of her friends were brutally murdered by the ghost of a child serial killer, and she's lined up to be the third. Nancy tries to convince her dad, Donald, that a badly burned man wearing a weird hat and a red and green sweater with a knife glove is responsible. Her dad knows who she's talking about, Freddy Krueger. While disturbed that she would bring that name up, she could have read about Freddy somewhere and concocted this story as a defense mechanism to cope with the loss of her two friends. Nancy's parents suspect that she's suffering from a stress-induced mental disorder that's also causing some sort of REM sleep behavior disorder so they take her to a medical facility to get checked out. As inexplicable as everything she experienced is, Nancy isn't entirely opposed to the idea that she might be going crazy. She agrees to go to sleep under their watch to see if there's something wrong with her. Initially, the doctor says he doesn't see any sign of pathology in her EEG, which is a test that detects abnormalities in your brain waves. He thinks she's just suffering from PTSD. Nancy eventually slips into deep 
REM sleep and starts dreaming. The doctor's dream equivalent of a Richter scale immediately goes haywire, and Nancy starts convulsing like she's possessed. The nurses rush in to awake her and then attempt to jab her with a sedative to calm her down, which she fights off. Nancy now has deep lacerations on her arm, and impossibly, Freddy's hat that she says she grabbed off of his head just before she was woken up. Her mom, the doctors, and the nurses were all there. They knew she didn't have anything on her when they tucked her in. There's no way she was able to cause those cuts and Mary Poppins a large dirty hat out of her hospital bed. Everyone's left shocked. None of this was in their textbooks. The results of the study are inconclusive, so Marge takes Nancy back home. Volunteering to undergo tests at a medical facility that studies sleep disorders is a risky but reasonable decision to make. With staff monitoring her closely, it's honestly a decent way to confirm that you're not crazy while getting some supervised shut-eye since Glenn's useless. Nancy was, yet again, luckily woken back up just before getting killed. Thwarting the nurse's attempts to jab her with a sedative was extremely important and likely saved her life. If they injected her, she'd have been stuck in the dream world with no ability to generate a physiological response strong enough to jumpstart her out of it. She was also lucky enough to have been grabbing Freddy's hat when she was woken up. This gave her a crucial piece of information. Whatever she's holding on to, or more realistically, whatever she's mentally clinging on to the hardest at the moment she's awoken is pulled into the real world. The first thing that comes to mind is pulling Freddy out into the real world and having Glenn smoke him with a 9mm like Trinity in the Matrix. The less cool but more practical move would be to go to the police station with Glenn, fall asleep, and try to pull Freddy out there. If she's unsuccessful, there's plenty of people to awake her. If she is successful, there's plenty of people to kill Freddy. It might not work work though. If Freddy's from the dream world, killing him in one dream won't stop him. He could be reimagined into existence by her if she dreams of him again. One piece of evidence to suggest it could work is if Freddy's hat is missing from his head in her next dream. If it is, then I'd say that she would have the green light. Then again, it could be missing because she had the belief that Freddy was no longer in possession of the hat, in which case defeating Freddy comes down to disbelief again. The hat is also interesting because it had a first and last name written inside it. Oddly specific. Might be worth running the name by the police to see if it happened to be a real person that incarnated into a dream demon. Despite witnessing the deep lacerations and hat appearing out of nowhere, the mom and all the doctors are all in denial that anything supernatural happened. Nancy's still on her own. The next morning, Nancy fights with her drunk mom about where she got the hat. While Marge is in denial that anything strange is going on, it's clear that she's deeply disturbed. Nancy questions her mother about the man's name written inside it. Freddy Krueger. Marge deflects, insisting that Nancy just needs to get some sleep. Nancy storms off and meets up with Glenn, who tells her about the Balinese dream skills, how she might be able to control her dreams, and how she could remove the evil by turning her back on it, and not letting her fear or recognition give it energy. It's convincing stuff, but Nancy's planning on drawing Freddy into an R-rated version of Home Alone. She heads back home to install her IEDs, and sees the newly installed metal grating all over her house her parents installed to stop who they they think is a copycat killer murdering Nancy's friends. Nancy heads inside and her mom ushers her into the basement. Marge tells her that Freddy Krueger was a serial killer that preyed on young children. When Krueger was apprehended, an improperly signed search warrant caused the evidence against him to be inadmissible. This led to him not being convicted and later released from prison. In an act of vengeance, she and Nancy's father, along with the other parents in the neighborhood, tracked him down to the old abandoned boiler room where he used to take the kids. Then they poured gas all over the place and burned it down with him inside. Marge pulls Freddy's glove out of the furnace, which she says she took the night they murdered him. Nancy now realizes that Freddy's out for revenge, somehow reaching from beyond the grave to murder them in their dreams. She calls Glenn to warn him that he might be next and to enlist his help in taking Freddy down. Her plan is to wait until midnight, then have Glenn bring his baseball bat and meet her outside. When she falls asleep and gets attacked, she's going to grab Freddy so that when she wakes up, he will be pulled into reality like like his hat. Glenn's job is to wake her up when she starts freaking out in her sleep, and to be ready to beat him to death with his baseball bat. Glenn somewhat apathetically agrees to the plan, and they hang up and wait until go time. How does a preppy jock like Glenn come across ancient literature of Balinese dream skills? Nancy really is a lucky girl to have such a cultured and helpful boyfriend. He offered Nancy some solid advice that makes sense. If it is her mind that controls the dream world, simply ignoring him will render him useless. Nancy's understandable skeptical. She's tried exclaiming and telling herself that it was just a bad dream, to no effect. 
Nancy finally learned the truth about Freddy Krueger, and that he was a real man that terrorized this town and ended up getting lynched for his crimes by the families, hers being one of them. Honestly, Freddy going back to his property after being released on a technicality with 20 pissed off families of the children he slayed was a terrible idea. Of course they were going to exact their own justice. He should have immediately left town. Nancy learning that Freddy is a real person is important. It seems like nobody besides Tina and Nancy were being hunted by him. Tina, Rod, and her must have some connection to Freddy by nature of their parents' vengeance. Why wouldn't Freddy go after their parents instead, though? They were the ones that killed him. A possible explanation is that Freddy did only prey on kids when he was alive. It might also have something to do with the kids being more fearful than adults and having more active imaginations, which he can exploit. He is a dream demon after all. It can't just be that they're kids, though, or else others would be getting killed, too. Has to be a combination. Nancy didn't seem to have any prior knowledge of Freddy, but before she started having nightmares. Marge is at the bottom of a bottle and obviously in a lot of fear right now. While Freddy tends to target kids, we can't assume that he wouldn't go after her mom, especially since she was one of the people that lynched him. Nancy needs to tell Marge everything now. Somehow the gruesome death coupled with his life of pure evil, Freddy was able to become a curse in the dream world. This is why I'm against movie protagonists killing wretched scum like Freddy in gruesome ways. As sweet as revenge can be, it often ends up creating a curse that gives them more power. Power. If you're going to do it, at least incinerate the remains so there's nothing tethering them to the real world, which is exactly what Nancy needs to go do, or get a priest to bless the remains. Who knows if it'll work? Probably not, but why not try? Running doesn't work in the dream world, and I doubt it works in the real world too. If her connection to Freddy is mental or supernatural, putting physical distance between the town and her wouldn't stop anything. Fighting Freddy seems like the best choice. Again, I think pulling Freddy out into the real world and ambushing him is a solid play. However, they're going about it all wrong, waiting until midnight when she's already sleep deprived and liable to pass out at any time, and when Glenn and her have to sneak out from under their parents' supervision makes coordination needlessly difficult. Nancy and Glenn should have immediately gone to a public location like a police station and done it there. It's a good thing Nancy was able to pull his hat out of the dream and thus create a strategy to pull him out and kill him in real life. If she hadn't pulled his hat out, Nancy might have considered trying to fight Freddy inside the dream world. This would likely be a bad idea. Idea. Nothing that happens within the dream world is permanent, except the damage she takes from it. She has a physical body, Freddy doesn't. By fighting him and even killing him, she's confirming his existence, recognizing the threat he poses, and thus will never be able to get rid of him. In fact, it will probably give him more power. She will have to fight endlessly, fighting him every night for the rest of her short life. If she makes one mistake, she's dead. Even if she imagines herself as Jesus with an M60, all Freddy needs to do is teleport behind her, which he's shown to be able to do and slit her throat. I also don't recommend trying to incept Freddy like in Rick and Morty. It's hard enough to keep track of one dream world. The last mistake Nancy made was not convincing Glenn to take this seriously. This whole time he still thinks it's bullshit. If Freddy comes for him, he won't be ready. Nancy fakes going to sleep, pours another cup of Joe, and waits until her mom is boozed out to call Glenn. Problem is, Glenn fell asleep. His parents pick up the phone and tell her to stay away from their son. They think she's a loon that's trying to wrap Glenn up in her schizophrenic episodes. The next call Nancy gets is from Freddy. She rips the phone line out in a scare, but it doesn't stop the phone from ringing. Curiosity gets the best of her. She picks the phone up again and Freddy gives her some tongue. Nancy realizes that like her premonition about Rod, Glenn is about to get attacked. She can't run over to rescue him in time because the metal bars on all the doors and windows. Glenn, having fallen asleep like a chump, gets sucked into his bed where he's blended up and erupted into a fountain of gore all over his bedroom. Glenn's mom hears his screams and rushes in to find the scene of carnage that even Dex would be overwhelmed by. While Nancy failed to adequately warn Glenn, nothing could have saved him. Freddy immediately sucked him into a blender and ground him up. Glenn's death, like Rod's and like Nancy's bathtub nightmare, make disbelief seem like a bad strategy. Glenn and Rod were not living with immense anxiety about Freddy. They didn't even believe in him at all. That didn't stop Freddy from being able to murder them without hesitation. Even though nothing could have caused Glenn to get gored like that except being fed through an industrial grade wood chipper, nobody believes Nancy's tale about the super natural return of Freddy. She's all alone in her fight. Nancy is still unable to realize that she's dreaming or control her fear. She also doesn't know if Freddy is aware of what goes on outside of the dream world, 
Seems logical to assume he wouldn't, but she should watch out for him trying to counter her plan in some way. Nonetheless, her plan to bait him out is still the best one she has. The cops show up to the scene along with Nancy's dad. Nancy calls Glenn's house to get through to him. She tells him that Freddy Krueger did it. She's going into the dream world to pull him out, and he needs to be sure to be at her room in 20 minutes to catch him. Like Glenn, Lieutenant Donald agrees just to get her to shut up. He doesn't follow her instructions and instructs some other cop to watch his house. Nancy starts rigging up booby traps. The first one is a sledgehammer held up by a tripwire. The second one is a light bulb filled with gunpowder. This takes all of 10 minutes. She sets her alarm 10 minutes from now and passes out immediately. This time, Nancy baits Freddy into attacking her. Somehow, her watch in the dream world is synchronized with her alarm clock. Right when the alarm goes off, she grabs Freddy. Her plan doesn't appear to have worked. All she brought out was some of the front porch. Then Freddy jumps out at her from behind the bed. She bashes his head in with a coffee pot and baits him into the sledgehammer trap while screaming at the useless cops across the street. Freddy chases her into the living room where her shitty light bulb bomb goes off, only momentarily stunning him. The cop finally gets Lieutenant Donald after hearing her scream for five minutes and hearing bombs go off in their living room. Nancy is running out of options. She baits him into the basement where her last trap is, a bucket of gas and a lighter. Freddy gets torched, again, and Nancy races upstairs as her dad and the cops rush in. She takes them to where she lit Freddy up, but his body isn't there. Immediately realizing that her mom is in danger, they both run upstairs to find Freddy on fire, strangling her. Nancy's dad tries to put the flames out. When he pulls the sheets back, their charred corpse of a mom looks like it's falling through a portal to hell. In this moment, Nancy realizes that she's been dreaming ever since she called her dad at Glenn's house. She tells her imaginary dad that she wants to have a moment alone. She knows what she needs to do. This is her Neo moment. She's starting to disbelieve. After her dad leaves, she feels Freddy rise up out of the bed behind her. Remembering what the late Glenn told her about dreams in the Balinese, she turns her back on him, telling him, you're nothing, you're shit. Freddy lunges at her, but her lack of fear renders him powerless, and he vanishes into thin air. Nancy was too hasty in her plan. After she realized Glenn was dead, she tried to execute the same plan, but with her dad as backup instead, she was relying on him to be there at a precise time. The problem was that her dad didn't believe her, and was preoccupied dealing with a murder scene. When she found Freddy in the dream world, he was missing his hat. This proved that her plan might actually work. Her wristwatch alarm surprisingly worked as planned too. I wouldn't have counted on it solely to wake me up with the time dilation present in dreams. She is out of close friends that she can rely on to wake her up though. When she pulled Freddy into the real world, her dad unsurprisingly wasn't there, and Nancy's three fallback traps sucked. The first was a sledgehammer hung up on a tripwire. It's definitely not a fun way to wake up, but it was never going to give Freddy anything more than a pause. The second was a light bulb filled with the gunpowder from shotgun shells, triggered by a lamp switch. Basically, a flashbang which only momentarily stunned him. Her third trap was to bait him into the basement, throw a bucket of gas on him, and light him on fire. Now, this one actually has the potential to be lethal. The problem with it is that she put it in the basement, a notoriously bad place to be in a fight because there's only one way in and out. She's liable to burn her house down, which her mom is currently drunkenly sleeping in, and fire doesn't kill quickly enough to stop him before he can kill her. Nancy would have been better off with a knife on her bedstand or grabbing the shotgun from wherever she got those shotgun shells from. The best option would be to wait and fall asleep at the police station. None of this mattered. Pulling Freddy out of the dream world and March's supposed death was all a dream itself. Once Nancy realizes this, and realizes that by fighting Freddy she's empowering him, she enters a zen state that evaporates Freddy's existence in her mind. This proves to work. Nancy leaves her bedroom and suddenly finds herself outside. Marge stands on the porch as Nancy heads off to school and randomly tells Nancy that she's going to quit drinking. Glenn, Rod, and Tina pull up and Glenn's car to take Nancy to school. When Nancy gets in, the convertible roof suddenly slams shut over their heads. It's not a normal roof, though. It's red and green like Freddy's sweater. Without their control, the doors lock, the windows roll up, and the car drives off, trapping them all inside. Marge waves goodbye to the kids, oblivious of their impending doom. Suddenly, Freddy's arm smashes through the front door's window and pulls her entire body through it. Marge is later confirmed to have died in her sleep by Nancy. This last dream was likely Marge's and may have been preventable had Nancy warned her. Nancy went on to survive with the use of Hypnosil, a fictional experimental drug which stops you from having dreams. Disbelief worked in her last nightmare with Freddy, but it's by no means a solution. Her bathtub drowning scene, Rod getting hung up in his sleep, Glenn getting blended, and Marge dying in her sleep all mean that Freddy can kill you before you have a chance. She later finds out a pattern in Freddy's attacks. He only attacks and can kill those who know about him, starting with the families of the vigilantes that murdered him, and spreading out to those who hear about him in his nightmare power. 
powers. Freddy's primary weakness is severing any connection he has to the real world. Nancy needs to warn and help the families of the vigilantes, then destroy records of his existence while being cautious of the Streisand effect. Overt attempts to destroy or hide information can bring attention to it, creating more potential victims for Freddy. In the end, Nancy did nothing to stop the spread of the Freddy mind virus, allowing him to continue his rampage and entrap countless souls. Let's recap the decisions which could have altered who lived and died. Tina was the first victim and had no idea what she was up against. Nancy should have warned Rod, but I doubt he'd have survived. Same thing with Glenn. He had no idea what was going on, but Freddy was able to kill him so suddenly that he couldn't have kicked himself awake or told himself it was just a bad dream. Marge falls into the same boat. She was in a drunken stupor and was probably immediately killed by Freddy, drowning her in alcohol. Nancy was immensely lucky that Freddy took his time with her, which enabled her to survive long enough to figure out how to temporarily stop him. It all ended up coming down to using Hypnosil to prevent her from dreaming. If she never got off of it and tried to stop Freddy's mind virus from spreading throughout the town, Freddy might not have been able to go on with his ensuing massacres. This would be extremely difficult and likely to fail. Every death, all the families talking, the news reports are all nearly impossible to contain. If one person speaks his name, it starts spreading again. Ultimately, I think Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street is unbeaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't think about Freddy Krueger coming to kill you in your dreams tonight.